Uh, welcome to the world today. I'm Vikas Maji Khan. Uh, today we're talking about uh, Rohingya Muslims' plight and the international community's response uh, along with uh, uh, North Korea and the American standoff that is also ongoing. So let me introduce my guests in the studio. Joining me at the moment we have Air Commodore Ghulam Mujadid and along with him we have Kamar Chima Saab. Thank you very much, sir, for being here. Uh, so let's get the conversation started about the plight of the Rohingya people and why is it that the United Nations is incapable or unwilling to help Rohingya people or even uh, talk about the plight of the Rohingya people and the suffering that they're going through in uh, Burma? Um, I think uh, uh, largely there is uh, a misconception here in our uh, community that the United Nations is actually not aware of uh, or is doing little for Rohingya people in uh, uh, Myanmar. Uh, actually, it is uh, to the contrary. United Nations and other uh, you know, humanitarian uh, agencies, uh, uh, whatever has been done, it has been done at the United Nations level as well as Amnesty International and uh, Human Rights Watch world. And they have done a lot. I think uh, if we count that what actors have done something for Rohingya uh, Muslims, I think uh, United Nations, which is still actively doing it, it is, uh, but they're also being prevented from actually... Uh, so they're being prevented, but they are, uh, I mean, we should not snatch this, uh, this thing from them that they, whatever is possible under the international system, they are doing it. Their massive food aid that is uh, ongoing since December, uh, this August 25th or 26th incident, th that has been recently stemmed by the junta or the regime in Myanmar. So, I mean, um, uh, we, and, and it is hoping that the international community is building up pressure and hopefully that they would allow the humanitarian assistance by United Nations inside this Rakhine and uh, the affected area for the Rohingya people. So I think uh, within the constraint that it has, United Nations... So can a government take unilateral action and prevent uh, humanitarian aid being given to us? Uh, persecuted people, sir? The, the, the sovereign states have this right, unfortunately, that uh, they, if they think that it is against their national interest or something, they can stop uh, the humanitarian aid or the United Nations aid. If it is not under Chapter 7 or something, it's not under a resolution and the world community is formally behind it, they can. It is up to them, it is up to the host government to accept what UN and UN does. Okay, uh, coming up, uh, another very worrisome sign that we have seen from uh, Burma is uh, Aung San Suu Kyi's complete silence, and a lot of people are condemning it. In fact, Malala Yousafzai has also tweeted about it, that she's still waiting for a response or any kind of condemnation coming from Aung San Suu Kyi. Uh, why is she silent? Well, I think she has been uh, criticized uh, uh, for his silence that is since long. I think um, why Aung San Suu Kyi is silent is because of his... Uh, animosity with Janta in Myanmar. It has been long. Uh, even his father was involved. Uh, his father, uh, who had getting Myanmar her independence, uh, sorry, her father was uh, helped Myanmar getting independence. Uh, but what, what matters is that uh, that she has reached a compromise with Janta, and that means the military uh, in Myanmar, and she does not want to annoy them at all. Uh, and there has been some sort of a settlement between uh, both of those. Uh, uh, so uh, she's silent because she does not, she understands that she does not have the capability to talk on that because, uh, or she has got, or she has been termed as an icon of democracy. The world recognized her as far as giving him uh, the Nobel Peace Prize uh, for, uh, for, for standing, Nobel Prize for standing for the people of Myanmar. But I think that is not justified, and that is where she has been criticized that uh, you have spoken a lot for democracy, human rights, values, which the international community shares together, but you have not spoken for your own people. This is where I think she is very uncomfortable but I think uh, I think it's the Janta's position, strong position, that is not letting her speak, uh, and that has that has compromised her own position. In fact, uh, in front of international community, uh, the Janta is strong in Myanmar, and uh, and 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 this is where the, the crisis starts. That even their own people cannot speak, even the icon of democracy, the icons of human rights cannot speak. This is where the problem starts, and this is where the people are unable to understand that why this lady who has been termed as or who has been considered as an icon for uh, giving uh, voice to the for voiceless, uh, why she is silent. So I think there is a compromise uh, that is between the Janta and his part party that is not letting her. But I think uh, in any way she is losing her. 
her respect very fastly. Uh, people are not giving her ideas, uh, not recognizing her specifically. And above all, I think, uh, nobody from the first world, I think the developed world is talking about um, uh, uh, Aung San Suu position. Uh, there is no comment on her position, uh, on position why she is silent, or even uh, the Norwegian government is not talking, or uh, this this uh, Nobel uh, uh, committee that needs to talk on that. Uh, we didn't give you this Nobel Prize for uh, staying silent on, on 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 that. And I think as as you were talking of Malala Yousafzai's perspective, uh, she, I read her uh, press release uh, which was issued on her Twitter account that uh, even Pakistan should follow Bangladesh example. I think she was uh, misled on this. Uh, uh, it's Bangladesh who has given uh, a lot of refuge, refuge, given space to a lot of refugees, but at the moment it's Bangladesh that is not letting uh, uh, the Rohingyas to come into Bangladesh right now at the moment. The, it, and it's their policy of not letting Rohingyas come into uh, Bangladesh started uh, from 2001 on uh, 2011 onward, where uh, whenever the Rohingyas entered to or came via the sea routes to the, and, and the Bengali Navy fired them back. And this is where I think um, that's a very important example to tell to the international community and to the Muslim world as well that the, the shape and the contours of the sovereign states have developed so fast that this uh, relationship of Muslim being or brotherly relations that has been undermined um, had this uh, relationship that the Muslims uh, should be given space come what may uh, had be, it had been in Bangladesh, uh, 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 it would have been much better. But uh, right now we have seen that uh, the Bangladesh constituents and Hasina Wajit has said that we are overly populated country and half a million Rohingyas are still living in Bangladesh and they cannot feed them. So at some point, um, and, and, and I cannot ignore Angela Merkel's perspective, she said that uh, uh, the world will remember that Mecca and Medina was much closer to Rohingyas as compared to the Europe uh, and we gave space to the uh, the people of Syria uh, uh, in, in, in Europe and, and the Muslims didn't give them space uh, in Muslim world. I think the criminal silence of the Muslim world and OIC is very, very, very disturbing for the Muslim world. Okay, let's go back uh, in the historical perspective. Uh, sir, in your opinion, uh, what is the, the reason for the hatred that uh, we've witnessed uh, across uh, the Burmese population for the Rohingya? It's not just the militant uh, or rather the military. Uh, but it's also a, a general apathy towards the, the plight of the Rohingya people in Burma. And the people of Burma, the Buddhist majority, are also uh, pretty much part of the problem rather than trying to uh, raise a voice against the injustice that is being perpetrated against these poor, hapless people. Yes, I think the main cause of uh, the lack of democracy and basic human uh, rights principle within uh, Myanmar is that for too long, more than a quarter of a century, uh, the uh, Myanmar is under military rule, Jantas. And uh, there are 135 minorities in uh, Myanmar, uh, official minorities. Rohingya Muslims, due to historic reasons, they are not part, uh, they are not one of those officially recognized uh, minorities. Since 1962, 1982, they have not been given the cities, the proper citizenship right. They cannot educate themselves. They cannot go to hospitals. You know, and they can't even move freely in the country. They cannot move freely if uh, they, you know, marry with you know outsiders or something. So they are in turn, within their own country. They, they within the state of uh, Myanmar, Rohingya Muslims, about 1.1 million of them, for a very long time, are without a state. So they are stateless community in the world. And United Nations, one of the reports uh, declared that the Rohingyas of Myanmar are one of the most uh, persecuted minorities in the world. So this is their plight. This, this, this is the, the, you know, the plight the of Rohingya is built into the structure of Myanmar society. There is a, a kind of fatwa or, or this by the uh, Buddhist monks you know, against you know, persecu uh, for persecuting the Rohingyas without any remorse or something. And there is a nexus between military janta and uh, the monks, the Buddhist monks, against this minor unfortunate minorities. 
as 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 guards there you know they 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 have used all methods once they are being persecuted to get out from the land of persecution to some other sanctuaries they have gone to india uh, by indirect method some of them have come to pakistan majority have uh, because they are contiguous borders and all that land borders so they have gone to bangladesh bangladeshis have done whatever they could and they have uh, as uh, about half a million of them and thousands have gone since you know the last two weeks or something and now they have said that uh, well we can, so what i mean they have said that but they have said that against you know uh, you know hosting um, many of them or something so international community the muslim countries uh, or the human rights organization must help bangladesh to absorb more uh, taiwan has requested bangladesh to open the keep the borders for rohingya open because they are according to him they are suffering from genocide and they they have no state of their own either they drown in the sea and hundreds of thousands of them have actually drowned in many seas because you know the, as a community international muslims or non muslims we are not taking care of this human plight which is very genuine the united nations have itself declared the most persecuted uh, the minority and i think every uh, a country with conscience not only oic but every country must come forward to help them especially that the uh, janta is rejecting the international collaboration on on to the very very tragic state of affairs sir and uh, khwaja asif has also for steps to help the rohingya what can pakistan do well i think uh, uh, pakistan in personal capacity would have to engage institutional response to rohingya Uh, that would come from either uh, from sark uh, why because uh, i think that will be another way to make sark active since uh, uh, burma is uh, just adjacent to india and then um, uh, then we can talk to oic as well uh, the, that, the, there is silence there and well, that well, is the prime minister Modi is also visiting mayor modi so what do you think is going to be the outcome of that i think you there won't be any outcome uh, there won't be any outcome and uh, uh, if you are going into india does not ho- hold high cards in mayama uh and uh, don't forget that india was involved in kind of the given impression that we had certain strikes in myanmar uh, quite some time back so i think uh, it won't be wise enough or it won't be i think it is not possible that uh, prime minister modi can talk that uh, and not that uh, he would even intend to uh, intend to that correct your human rights record while his own human rights record is uh, is very disturbing for everyone so uh, i don't so he, he does not have high moral cords even to talk on that but i think in such kind of situations where one country is not responding and one country is not behaving as per the international mandate uh, uh, since uh, being a sovereign country um, in the united nations have given him all the respect and uh, power so i think only the institutional tools are very much important uh, that could uh, from where we can respond oic is to spawn size in front of you i don't know uh, this uh, so called islamic military alliance which is silent uh, for what that this alliance is nobody knows um, can that alliance will help this is where uh, since the tors have not been decided so no one knows how it will respond uh, so the tiers have not even come out of uh, from any anywhere where they were hiding even if they were so i think so uh, institutional sponsors need even oic needs to send its committee there and send its delegation there to talk to the government to talk to the gender to do something and i think this is where uh, the institutional response need to come from everywhere uh, g- giving space to all these misplaced people is fine giving them to ask in come in our country the turkish are saying we will give them 7 crore dollars if the bengalis give them space that's fine you create small zones where you give them space and you just let them uh, that's not the issue this is not the that's not i think this is where we have to make them responsible that the monks who are so much sober in dealing with each other or their buddhist tradition is so much wonderful in dealing with each other why they are not just creating this environment of harmony where everyone can live in a co- existence so i think this is where these we don't forget uh, uh, khan sahab these were the rohingyas these are the muslims that traveled with the british from india to myanmar when the british were ruling this part of the world and when they traveled from india and they traveled to myanmar and the british left the myanmar and india we all got independence this community lived there but they have not been recognized since then it's not just today's case it's about 70 years back and even before uh, if, if when the british left uh, this part of the world so it's not about today's case it's a long case but since the violence has erupted uh, and, uh, and 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 there is a point that uh, 
there is an organization that is uh, that they within of the rohingyas that is using uh, guns to give uh, justice uh, to rohingya uh, muslims and in return uh, violence that is coming from state has got multiplied uh, and that although they have a right to protect themselves but i think the, the criminal part of the whole story is that international media is not portraying the story thanks to the social media we have got the pictures and uh, got the videos and we have known how things are happening uh, the united nations the european union the un declaration of human rights uh, 1948 uh, and all the bodies uh, the special session of the un security council that happens everywhere i personally believe they cannot be any response other than an institutional response that need to come from every asean is sitting there they can they can talk on that i think uh, Uh, since uh, there is no proper setup uh, because janta is calling the shots although uh, her, uh, her party is is ruling uh, at the moment but uh, they have very strong hold uh, but i think the criminal part of the whole story is the silence of everyone even the muslims uh, the saudi arabia need to talk the iranians need to talk the turkish are talking the pakistanis need to talk uh, i think and the muslim world is not talking on it and i think even more thing that will be important let's not make this uh, case a uh, muslim versus buddhist case make it's it in a humanitarian case. case that is where we can drag in and force the international community to speak up uh, unzip your tongues and just say what you have to say uh, and this is where you you need to be more sober uh, if you have uh, responded to the miseries of the misplaced people or idps of uh, syria and iraq and yemen and 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 libya this is the right place where you have to talk right. uh, and i think uh, here uh, the lai lama need to talk as well yes, we have, the man we, who we haven't really heard her her and, and this is i think very yes. disturbing situation and and and, and i don't know how then and myanmar is not that powerful country which on which everyone uh, can compromise its foreign policy and mujahid sahab in your opinion sir what can pakistan really do we've heard what the turkish president mr erdogan has said he's called it a genocide and ethnic cleansing going on without in mincing his words and he's as you also mentioned the people without a country uh, what can anybody do to help their plight sir yes i think institutional response if by institutional response we mean that organizations set up by the state of the state themselves then of course once you de- once a state deals with another state then there is a laid out procedure of dealing you know every state is independent for example and myanmar like any other state can say that we don't want your interference maybe you are anybody because we are a sovereign state either you just uh, un- undo our sovereignty and then you know do whatever and there are methods of doing that for example genocide if we take this case to the international court of justice or the required forum and declare the regime as genocidal then there are automatic you know modes of behavior available to the international community asean for example can can go at its own take actions to stop the genocide so we need to go to the right co- corners and uh, you know at one time we say that the muslims have not done nothing and we want to make it a muslim case and all that at other a genuine political case there is a genuine you know a, a persecution of a human minority or a segment in a particular country on which everybody agrees you know at the end the action that has been done so far is in the same direction second is that once you are living in a country maybe we are muslims or not, whatever you once you end up into armed struggle and you know your strengths and weaknesses i think um, uh, it is just islamic that once our prophet sent a part of the muslims to to abyssinia uh, they behaved as legitimate and peaceful citizens of that state now if you want to live in 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 uh, in uh, myanmar uh, and we know that the very myanmaris for the last about 30 years have suffered unspeakable torment by the janta their own people i mean uh, uh, the, the, uh, why was a nobel prize given to her for rohingyas or for the for her own people or something right. so who were being persecuted and by they were being persecuted by, by, by the general or, or military themselves or yeah. something yeah. so once you, you are muslim minority so why why don't we do the islamic struggle over there and with our character and all prove that we are you know better human beings and we are an asset for myanmar why do we have to take up arms i mean just i'm just why do we have to think everything uh, you know as, as a jihad or something you know we are living in that 
country. So better you let that. So having said that, there are many aspects that we need to look at. And then just because, you know, there, there is a situation, you look at the situation and, uh, you know, you, we must strike the chord that is most pertinent to that situation. And only then I think we can make a difference to them. And uh, Chima Sab, uh, you also talked about OIC, but the question is that what are Muslim countries really doing to help the Rohingyas? And also, how is Bangladesh handling the influx of refugees? Are they even capable of doing that? I think uh, uh, there are two ways to, to look at Bangladesh position. First, because that is just a neighbor, uh, uh, and they can they are, they are the, just very close to Myanmar. Uh, I think, uh, and the one is that uh, we need to understand that the Banga Bangladesh is. Uh, Populated. We like it or not, and I think their perspective is very right in it. But second, what what could be done for that? I think this is where uh, a, a kind of a, a Muslim world need to respond that if they can create a cornered uh, uh, place or a very fortified place where you just let those people come in the way Iranians did for the Afghans. We didn't do it in Pakistan. That's why we have a trouble of these religions. The Iranians created a place where from that place get out of that. Uh, what I was, and, and this is here where the UNHCR and the other international bodies will give you food and whatever you need, all that. So uh, the, the, the Bengalis must be requested and asked that you need to get a place where we just can send all these people and, uh, uh, and where this is international community, Muslim world, uh, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, and everyone else, they need to give them money, food, shelter, and whatever they, they need. I think that will be, that, that is where you, we, we can convince them or... Or uh, the way Europeans have divided uh, the Syrians and other refugees of the Middle East, that could be the way. Uh, for example, if Pakistan can take 5,000, 10,000, although we are already burdened because of the Afghan refugees, we are not in a position at all. Only on the assurance of the international community and the assurance of the powerful countries. And similarly, uh, the other Muslim countries, they need to take all those people. I think uh, uh, they need to all take all these people, some 5,000, 10,000, 15,000, whatever the number they can afford, they can have. That, that is the one response. And all similarly, right, uh, before we go on, there's one uh, more interesting, um, important question that I wanted to ask. And Mujahid Sawa, I'll ask you, and that is about ARSA, uh, the Arkan Rohingya Salvation Army. Uh, who are they? What is their role in this entire debacle? And uh, can you know, the, uh, what can we expect from uh, that? As I just said in the last, you know, I was referring to this thing. Uh, they claim them uh, Arakan Salvation Army or something. Uh, ostensibly, they are fighting for the rights of Rohingyas, the, the Muslims and all that. And, you know, uh, the late they did was uh, earlier on, about two, two, three years back, they killed some security guard. And then the whole, you know, mayhem started in, in 2012 or something. And now on 25th of August or something, they again attacked um, the some, some military police, check police check posts, or military positions or police positions and all that. And this uh, current turmoil is because is a of result that. of that. You know, it's very simple. I'm just saying that uh, it is no act of bravado. Uh, because uh, if bec you whatever salvation army that you are you don't have the sense that if you did that the the op opposite side is so powerful that this will occur but as a result of this uh, these attacks that the uh, that uh, this uh, arsa has done on the police camps uh, they are now targeting civilians innocent women and children are being butchered and then the the arsa people are not being attacked by the Myanmar army or police or anybody. They're not the ones that are under attack. It's the civilian people, not the women and children that are the ones that, bearing that, the brunt. That is true. That, that's what I'm saying. But these Arakan or, or, or these, these people who, who are militants and they have attacked this, their linkage is being established by the Myanmar authorities with the Muslims. Because the same said, old terrorism. The same old terrorism and this, uh, and, uh, this um, label that uh, they've, they've, they've created. They now you can just label anybody as a terrorist they and then can, go for them. They, uh, so once that happens, why can't we enter into the peaceful political process of the country? Well, you, so that, that we, was supposed we, we, to have taken place because yeah. uh, we have the recommendations of a commission that was headed by Mr. Kofi Annan. And he uh, went and he gave a number of recommendations for the, the integration of the Rohingya people in Myanmar society. Nothing ever happened about the Kofi Annan's commission's uh, recommendations. Why not, sir? OK, so the, they are recommendations by Kofi Annan. Such a big name, such a big organization is behind the ranting or trying to vie for some concern Rohingya. So that is true. Second is, 
that we need to look at the internal dynamics of Myanmar, Myanmar and we need to be you know, a little, uh, observing it a little minutely. This uh, San Anshu, the, the Nobel Prize, Aung San Suu Anshu, Suu yeah, and uh, she is also the head of the party that won the elections in yeah, well, She's the de facto leader. Uh, so. she, she is the leader, but you know why is she a de facto leader and why is she the actual leader that she is? She won the elections. Why? Because of the same thing. She herself is suffering from the state's paranoia about the minorities and the, and the non-Myanmar people. Her husband and children, they have dual nationality. They, they are British or they have British nationality. Just because of that, and she's married to the mother of the British children, just because of that, she is a legitimate leader. A leader that international community has so glorified and recognized. Over. Given a leader that has, that has led the struggle which uh, culminated mm. into some ki kind of a democratic, you know, uh, inroads into the Burmese society which was so much hardcore against the democracy. Absolutely. She herself is the victim of the state paranoia and the structural violence that is there against minorities or the people that, that are not... So uh, are you know, saying, sir, that her hands are also tied? Very tight, as uh, um, Chima, I think he, he did mention. Uh, she is, uh, she just, um, um, it's, it's, it's... Uh, but don't, do you think that there might also be some kind of sympathy towards the attitude that the Burmese or rather the uh, Myanmar people are are posturing or festering towards the Rohingya people? Do you think that she might also be suffering from the same prejudice? I, I don't think so because, you know, she is a leader and she has contributed to the, the democratic movement in, in Myanmar. That is for sure. She has contributed. Once you contribute to that and that democratic struggle was against the very setup in which she lived, you know, she was, uh, you know, put into some kind of a prison or house arrest for such a long time. She was herself persecuted and all that against by those very people who now share power or Myanmar. Myanmar along with her party and her struggle. So I don't think as a leader uh, she is exclusive. Uh, I think she is inclusive in her approach because she's a democrat. All right. And uh, I hope that uh, her, uh, you know, <coughs> wisdom or her, uh, you know, uh, this point of view prevails in Myanmar. Well, let's hope that that takes place. But right now the people of Myanmar, rather the Rohingya, are suffering unspeakable horrors. And the world community needs to wake up and... Uh, take it upon themselves to raise their voice against this uh, br barbarity and brutality against the hapless, unarmed uh, people who, are, who should be given citizenship in Myanmar since they've been living there for generations and generations as well. Let's move on to our other very interesting and hot topic, sir, and that is the confrontation we are witnessing between the U.S. and North Korea, sir. Uh, recently, they conducted a nuclear test with a, which they said was a hydrogen bomb. Uh, what are the implications, sir? What do you think is going to... Uh, be the few world where we have the U.S. on one side threatening fire and fury and uh, Mr. Kim Jong-un on the other side, you know, threatening the same to the U.S. mainland. Uh, what can we expect in the coming weeks and months? Yes, I think the situation is uh, um, as comic as it is dreadful. It is very dreadful situation. Uh, we have an atomic power, you know, a country that has developed atomic and hydrogen bombs, uh, and we have then the superpower or the power on the other side. And in between is the international politics, which is, a, which remains a game of opportunity. In this apparently dreadful scenario, and to make it more dreadful so that United States of America or China or Russia can have their own, you know, uh, part in the in the game is the name of the international politics. Okay. So uh, 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 any wrong set, any miscalculation by either party, you know, the North Koreans or the people of the United States or the leaders of the United States of America uh, could end up into the most frightened scenario that we... Yeah, uh, Mr. Putin, uh, the president of Russia, has said yeah. that it's a catastrophic situation Very that you can be going towards. That's, that's, that is absolutely right. So I think uh, both sides, you know, the North Korea have a history of development of nuclear weapons. And um, I think uh, it was a member of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. It joined in 1985, and then it left that treaty then it started to develop the nuclear uh, uh, weapons because you know, if you want, if you think that the treaty of NPT is against your national interest, you can do exactly as North Korea did. It left the treaty, 
and started to develop weapon. The world started to, uh, you know, uh, put questions or something. Absolutely. But then it prevailed. It was a state, so it pursued, and now it is a nuclear power. And uh, there is no moral principle that can stop a nation for its national security to develop anything. You, know, you can't uh, tell a nation, you have developed, so you, are you more than any other human state or something? No, you're not. So every, so this is the situation now, we, they, they have this capability in set, instead of sanctioning them, uh, because you think that you can, and then instead of you know, going a step further and you know, threatening them with, a, with some uh, punitive strike or something, I think there should be negotiation. And every sane country and actor on this planet is saying that it, the solution has to be quick and it has to be on the table. And all uh, solutions really boil down to a political exactly. solution and exactly. the will to actually sit down and talk to your opponents and find a way forward. But uh, unfortunately, we're not seeing that when we look at the rhetoric that is coming out of the United States and from North Korea, of course. Uh, Mr. Trump says that appeasement will not work for dealing with uh, North Korea after the nuclear tests. Uh, Kamar Saab, in your opinion, uh, what did Mr. Trump mean by appeasement? Because uh, the South is also quite worried about this, the situation. <coughs> I think uh, uh, why Americans are not taking any action is because of South Korea and Japan. Those who suffer are their partners, the strategic partners. Um, I think, and in this position, uh, it's not about, North Korea is not worried about sanctions. They have faced crippling sanctions. They're not worried about the sanctions. You know, Trump is, I think, uh, uh, Trump and the American or uh, the international community, or uh, I would say the American rather than the Europeans, uh, they are just trying to inflame the situation. I have met many Japanese and the Koreans. They are not happy the way the uh, the inflammatory statements coming from the American government. This is very inappropriate as well. You know, who will lose? It's the Americans. The Japanese, Koreans, and the region will lose. They are all developed countries. They do not want a war at any cost. Once you are a secure person or a secure state, you, you will never go for a war. The insecure person, insecure state, insecure land, uh, where there is gen uh, where there is a one person you cannot speak, and they are not going to lose. They are already losing. They are already losing. So there is you don't have any option just to give sanctions, 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 and then at the end of the day you have to feed them. <laughs> the Chinese they will feed them. They have a border with them. They know that if we will not feed them, they will cross the border. They will come in. So just so the world is like you know sometimes you are in a position where uh, you have so many cards, but you cannot use all those cards. You're stuck between <laughs> the devil and the deep blue sea. Deep sea. sea. So uh, it's, it's, so they, the North Korea is, is a puzzle. How can you solve it? You have to be cool and calm. You need to engage them the way they have engaged. And let me tell you, there will come a time where you will have to engage them. Because one simple miscalculation, Japan is gone. One calculation, South Korea is gone. And then there's Guam. And, and yes, and North Korea, no problem. They're already gone. So who is to lose? Is the Jap Japanese and, 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 and the South Koreans and then the, uh, the Americans and the partners, they will lose. But if you look at the statements that are coming out from the U.S., for example, Nikki Haley, the U.S. ambassador to the U.N., she has said that the North, North Korea is begging for war. Those are her exact words. So when you have this kind of a rhetoric, uh, Mr. Kim Jong-un is I think that will perceived be, to be an unstable and I, uh, unpredictable leader. I think that will be a trap. That will be a trap for the United States if the United States get engaged in North Korea. It will not bring anything out of North Korea at all. But they, they, and, and the South Koreans do not want a war. The Japanese don't want a war. And they will never, ever let the United States to get engaged in any kind of a low-intensity conflict. Because looking at the missile technology, looking at the hydrogen bomb, looking at, the, you know, you just cannot even engage in a conventional warfare with these North Koreans. That is the problem. The only the tool they have is we are going to use hydrogen bomb. You know, a, a, a nuclear bomb can damage a kilometer, two kilometer, three kilometer, four kilometer years. A hydrogen bomb can you know, eliminate an entire city. So just imagine the catastrophic weapons or the catastrophic machinery the North Koreans have. You just, so that is why even in Pakistan's case, we do not want to engage in, in a conventional war. That's why we have a, a nuclear weapons just to get away with the conventional war. So in North Korean example, I think... They will, the sanity will prevail and they will, with the passage of time, even they don't care about the Chinese, this hydrogen, use of hydrogen bomb is an embarrassment for the Chinese as well. 
so they don't care anyone they don't speak uh, for for uh, for peace so they have they are they're very close society no engagement uh, they don't talk to even uh, even the uh, the north korean embassy or the uh, wherever they are around the world they do not talk and engage so, so and the real question is that what does north korea really want sir i mean threatening the united states is really not going to achieve much so why is it that the americans are also uh, loath to engage with the north uh, with North Korea, why there, there is this uh, talk about a perception of uh, uh, direct en engagement between the North and the U.S., which is uh, eluding everybody for some reason. So, what exactly are they after? Uh, as far as the theory of nuclear deterrence goes, and as far as the conceptions that is built around the nuclear weapon uh, tells us, is that nuclear states do, will never enter into a direct war with each other. It is mutually suicidal. It is true that North Korean weapons can probably destroy a very small part of United States of America. But even that is going to be catastrophic for the world. Wherever the, the hydrogen bombs will fall, if at all they did, they will destroy a lot of area in the vicinity of maybe China, vicinity of Russia, in, in the Pacific or something or air something. So, the, the nuclear war or the war between United States and Americans are out because the, the, the theory of deterrence, nuclear deterrence, says that uh, the, the war between two nuclear armed states, no matter how big is the one state and no matter how small number of weapons, the smaller nuclear weapon, the small state has. The question of direct confrontation does not arise especially in a case where there is no conventional ability that has been shown by uh, the North Koreans. They, have, they, they don't, don't say that, okay, if something happens to us, we will you know, feed these, these many divisions and cores and we will fight whom? whom? They, they will, if it comes from the United States or elsewhere, whom they will fight? North Korea, uh, South Korea or something? So, the, so w once the escalation is to start with between the nuclear weapons, I think the war is out. If somebody wants to do it and if we unfortunately enter into it by miscalculation or you know the wrong estimations, that will be very tragic, unfortunate for the mankind. Okay, so what is the outcome as we discussed earlier? The, the, the settlement has to be quick and it has to be based on sincerity. Third is that maybe the rhetoric has been increasing because United States of America wants to, uh, you know, put up anti-ballistic missile systems in South Korea. They want to have torpedo air defense systems installed uh, in the vicinity of, uh, you know, South Korea. They want to put their atomic weapons on the, uh, you know, uh, in South Korea or Korean Peninsula, which is by treaty not allowed or something. So uh, if somebody wants that by you know making the scenario more dreadful they are going to accrue some strategic mileage of this sort i think that is also destabilizing it for the world and china as you, we, we know has said very clearly that any attack china will not tolerate any attack on north korea on the korean, can, korean peninsula you, so, so 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 you can you can do whatever you feel like or something but this is that if they if there is an attack in the korean uh, peninsula for for sure china and russia will get involved for sure because uh, that is what, what the, and if there is uh, uh, you know uh, there is some kind of uh, change or alteration in the strategic balance by the installation of third or anti ballistic missile defenses or by putting weapons over there they are a direct threat to china and russia from then and you know what happened in the in the cuban missile crisis that nuclear weapons got very close to the mainland united states of america right. and they you know took on the whole world and they just wanted to destroy everybody and something that you take these nuclear weapons away from our mainland. So same is the case with the situation with uh, China right. and same would be with Russia or Absolutely something. So. so I think you know what, what they're doing but I think instead of putting the world into you know, some kind of uh, very very uneasy mindset and situation, uh, the solution to this conflict has to be uh, uh, the North Korean. They may be whatever there, but they are doing it for their prestige. All right, sir. And they are doing it for their honor. So we leave they it at that. So thank you very much for taking out the time and being on the show. Well, you had a conversation, and in conclusion, we'd like to say that uh, most nations uh, should follow the path of rationality and uh, political uh, 
solutions to their issues and that is the only way forward and violence is not the answer as the Chinese have also said on occasion. With that hope and on that note, it's goodbye.